Good afternoon, Dr. Steve Conley. I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association. We're very pleased to have you with us this afternoon for another in a series of webinar training sponsored by, I'll call ourselves ASHA. We try to do one of these each month. Today you're joining us uh, for the Food Allergy Safety at School webinar. We're very tickled to have very talented faculty to work with you today. and We're going to talk for about an hour, at which time we will stop and take questions. You'll need to type those questions in on the webinar as you are linked. We do these um, quite frequently, and I want to make sure that you also know that uh, we have a conference coming up next month, about three weeks from today, in Louisville, Kentucky, and we hope that we can see you there. A little more about the American School Health Association. We are multidisciplinary. Our intent is to build the capacity of our members to plan, develop, coordinate, implement, evaluate, and advocate for effective school health strategies that contribute to the optimal health and academic outcomes for all children and youth. We have a very spectacular journal called the Journal of School Health that we're very happy to send to our members and those who subscribe each month. The annual conference I already mentioned will attract approximately 500 professionals from all over the country and a few foreign visitors. Today with the Food Allergy Safety Webinar, our mission is to provide school nurses with comprehensive education on food allergy safety in an effort to minimize the risk of allergic reactions among students while engaged in the learning environment. We hope that our outcome today will be that you will understand the signs and symptoms of food allergic reactions. You'll understand data supporting the need for food allergy safety training for schools. Understand the school's responsibility, the primary risk areas and potential protocols, and prepare school personnel with emergency action plans to obtain tools to evaluate and to implement potential guidelines. I will be telling you a little more about credits for this program, but there's a statement that we must read in advance to make sure that everyone understands that the planners and the presenters of this educational activity disclose that their presentations and the answers that we present for the question and answer period has no conflicts of interest. We will be speaking in a sequence in which we'll have Dr. Fred Likely, who's in Indianapolis, Kathleen Silverman, who is in the Chicago area, then Tammy Studebaker, who's on the eastern shore of Maryland, and Sally Schussler with the National Association of School Nurses, we're tickled, is here with us from Silver Spring, Maryland. As I noted, we will be going in sequence. We will open up for questions after the fourth presentation with Ms. Schussler. But at this time, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Fred Likely, who will be our first presenter. Dr. Likely is the Director of Allergy Services at James Whitcomb Riley Hospital for Children, and he specializes in asthma, allergy, and clinical immunology. Food allergies make up the largest part of his practice. Dr. Likely also is a professor of clinical pediatrics at Indiana University. He writes and reviews articles about food allergies on his blog, which is sweetly called Allergies, a Likely Story. With that said, we're ready to turn to Dr. Likely. The floor will be yours. Hello. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can get my slides up there for you. Are you okay? Uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share a passion, and that's uh, food allergies. And uh, the challenge to you as uh, personnel in the schools is daunting. So uh, hopefully what we're going to get through here today is uh, uh, why do we need to be concerned? And for the most part, it's pretty obvious we need to protect children who have food allergies from any harm. And along that line, also recognize what, a uh, true allergic reaction is and be very, very prompt in trying to treat that reaction. Uh, there are a lot of adverse reactions to foods of which allergy per se is one of many. So we're going to delve into what food allergy truly is 
it can rear itself in a number of different presentations. The one that you're going to be most pressed with is the potential for anaphylactic shock. And we'll go over how to treat the reaction, and I'll share with you some of the information that's coming out about what the future for food allergies might be with some of these children. So what is a food allergy? It's, uh, this all comes from uh, one of the two references that I provided at the end as you get the slide set if you wanted to look at this. It's the guidelines that came out from a government panel at the very end of last year. And the second reference that I think is going to be good, great is uh, from Dr. Sisher and Todd Marr from the section of allergy from the Academy of Pediatrics. And both are referenced and both are online for your access. But a food allergy will be an adverse health effect that comes from a very specific immune response that will occur every time that child gets that food and within usually a short period of time. Food reactions are basically broken down to those that are toxic and those that are non-toxic. Uh, certainly we can see foods causing food poisoning from infectious agents, or sometimes there are compounds in foods that act like uh, medications or pharmacologic reactions. Going over to the right side are non-toxic reactions, can be food intolerances and lactase deficiency or lactose, the sugar uh, intolerance, uh, is, is very common in the population. And then you get down to what really is food allergy, and it's that allergy that's it's usually needed by, mediated by an antibody, IgE, and there are a few examples that are not IgE mediated but behave like food allergy, and the ones we're going to be most concerned about are those that have their onset of action within a few seconds. Usually a life-threatening reaction will be seen within two hours of the exposure. Most probably you're not going to be struggling too much with uh, children who have the atopic dermatitis presentation of uh, food allergies. And a new up-and-coming problem is that of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a very, very peculiar presentation of food allergy. A little bit about uh, epidemiology. Uh, if you ask people, about, about a quarter of the population will say that they really have a food allergy, but when you get down to the, the proof of the matter, one to two percent adults will have a true food allergy if you do a challenge. It's a little bit higher in children, and you might find that uh, one in 25 in that school of yours will have some issues with a real food allergy. The incidence has doubled in the last 10 to 20 years, and then my next slide will go into some potential reasons for that. And clinical sensitivity, you have to be careful with that's what really happens to them when, when they're exposed. There are a number of people that are out there with numerous positive allergy tests to foods, but those, uh, you know, we know what our testing techniques were going to be falsely positive about 50% of the time. But those who have that great history, that clinical sensitivity, usually it's one food, rare to be two, rarer to be three, rarer to be four, rarer to be more than that. And it's been said that there's been over 170 foods that have been reported to cause reactions. Almost anything that's been eaten by mankind as long as he's been on the planet can cause a food reaction. And the biggest number that I could come up with some of this epidemiology that uh, is an eye-opener is that 25% of serious reactions that occur in children occur when they've not carried the previous diagnosis. So that's that you have to be alert to this possibility. It could, it could happen just to, actually right out of the blue. So why the increase in food allergy? Uh, my little acronym is GOK, God only knows. I think there's a Nobel Prize out there for whoever really figures it out. Perhaps we're too clean or too healthy and our immune systems aren't being stimulated in a way against uh, the tendency to be allergic. Uh, there's a lot of thought that some of these food sensitivities are not coming from actual ingestion, but they're uh, being sensitized to the environment, things that are getting on the skin, specifically broken skin, that leads to sensitization. Uh, there's probably a tendency for us to test a lot and test too much. 
uh, the concept of doing panels for testing to see what's positive rather than taking the other approach as to what is the story and see what matches up to the story. So there's a lot of a number of children out there that are carrying a legacy of uh, numerous positive tests. And I think we're probably waiting a little bit too long to feed the infants. And uh, maybe we should be doing uh, some of these potentially hyperallergenic foods a lot earlier in the child's life. So all, all theories for what's, what's, what could be going on there. So what's an allergen? An allergen is a protein or a glycoprotein. I know we all hate biochemistry, but it, it does have some relevance. It's of a specific size. And some of these allergens are denatured by heat. A lot of the fruits and vegetables will lose their allergenicity if they're heated up. And a lot will lose uh, their allergenicity when they're exposed to acid and stomach acids. Your allergen is not a pure sugar. They are not lipids or fats. So the oil issue uh, usually, usually is not a problem, but there are some rare cases where it might carry over protein. The example, for the most part, is hot-pressed oils are usually clear. You can see through them. They don't contain any protein. Asian oils tend to be cold-pressed. They're put in amber jars because they, the oil looks like crankcase oil. There's a lot of crud in there, and that crud tends to be protein, and that, that is a risk for the allergic individual. And our allergens really are not chemicals, preservatives, or colorings. They act as a, as a pharmacologic agent that could cause some reactions. So with allergy, you need two major components. You need to have a reaction that is consistent with what we see with allergy. And you have to have that atopy tendency. That means you're making antibodies. So if you have antibodies but no reaction, you're not allergic. If you have a reaction but you can't determine antibodies that's not allergic. You need you need to two things together, that reaction and that production of Ig that's related to that particular exposure. Food allergy can rear its head in many, many different ways, and the most serious one is anaphylaxis. You can also have some issues with the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, I'm I suffer from the oral allergy syndrome. If somebody gave me some watermelon here, this lecture would be over because my my voice would just totally go for about an hour, but it recovers without any other untoward events. Skin reactions, hives, uh, contact dermatitis can occur with this, or contact uh, urticaria. And uh, there are, it's very, very rare for a food to cause an isolated respiratory symptom, but it can show its way in many, many different ways. How do you treat a food allergy? Uh, panel to the left is avoidance, 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 avoidance. That is the best way to deal with it. Uh, a few things that have come along with the, some of the other foods that are out there. The peanut issue, you can avoid, you, know, you need to do practice the avoidance matters, but the contact to peanut really has not been associated with any life-threatening reactions. They can give you some skin reactions, and the risk here is that if there's contact and that material on the fingers finds its way into the mouth or even on cut skin, then there's systemic access and then there's a potential for a reaction. The protein vapor, does not, now the vapor of the peanut does not contain any protein, so that would not elicit an allergic response. And the whole point about peanut, which is our biggest culprit, there needs to be some way to get to the systemic system to get them to cause a reaction. Well, some of the other foods, like when you cook fish, there is protein in the vapor. They can cause respiratory reactions, and avoidance should also include the fact that uh, you, we shouldn't be using foods in some of the crafts that the children are, are involved with. And good old soap and water is the best way to get the antigens off of a surface or off of the skin. Those antiseptic gels do not get rid of all the uh, protein. Treating. Uh, there's a couple ways of dealing with treatment. You're going to be more involved with treating an acute or helping that child who's having an acute allergic reaction. For the most part, it's going to be anaphylaxis. And again, anaphylaxis will occur quickly. The sooner it occurs to the exposure, the more serious it may be. The long-term management of food allergy are some of the hopes that we have in the, in the future of how we can handle these children. 
And it's important to point out, and this comes from the pediatric article, uh, again referenced at the end, that a fatal reaction to a food in a child is really a rare event, and we're very thankful for that. Anaphylaxis, the problem when there's a bad outcome is we've delayed. We've delayed in recognizing it, and we delayed in, in jumping on it and getting the proper treatment. Know the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. They are systemic. There's usually, 85% of the time, some skin manifestation and some other organ system that's involved. In children, usually it's the respiratory tract. It can also be the gastrointestinal tract. It could also be the cardiovascular symptom, uh, system. Beware of that timing. The sooner to the exposure, the worse it could be. There are a number of comorbid conditions that can make it harder to treat. And with peanut, it only could take a quarter of a kernel of peanut to cause a problem. And your bigger players are going to be peanut, tree nuts, and milk. Uh, the patient population that's at risk uh, for many reasons, it's teenagers because of their risk-taking uh, behavior and lack of um, wariness, but they are a little bit more prompt to have problems. And most reactions that are going to be seen in our preschool and school-age child are not going to be anaphylaxis. And again, we're very thankful for that uh, uh, tendency. The next three slides are features of anaphylaxis. The onset of within minutes to a couple hours, usually within two hours, where some part of the skin or the mucous membrane is involved and there's respiratory compromise, the wheeze, the, the noisy breathing, decreased peak flow, lack of oxygen, they're turning blue, or the cardiovascular system is, is hit and there's low blood pressure. Usually there's vasodilatation and all the blood has gone to the periphery. There could also be not only the skin, respiratory, the decrease in blood pressure, and the persistence of gastrointestinal symptoms, having two or more of these, persistent vomiting, persistent vomiting could be added to the anaphylactic presentation. Decreased blood pressure, and it does it depend upon the age, less than the systolic, less than 70 in the 1 to 10 year old, and less than 90 in the 11 to 17 year old. That it occurs and stays in as persistent as a, as a cause of great concern. That's a cardiovascular event. The things that make it more difficult to get someone through anaphylaxis is the concurrent problem with asthma. If you know they have asthma, be prepared for a little bit more difficult situation. Have those bronchodilators ready. I've managed a, a child with anaphylaxis that unbeknownst to me was on a beta blocker and they were not responding, not responding, but knowing that this form of therapy, which is often used for arrhythmias of the heart or for migraine headaches or high blood pressure, will make an allergic reaction more difficult to treat and could lead to a fatal outcome. So knowing who's on agents like that uh, help us with our how aggressive we need to be with, with the child. And for the most part, the children don't have too many other organ system problems, and uh, it's rare to have significant heart disease. Uh, that does compromise treating treatment of allergic problems in the older population. Uh, when you're treating the children, get rid of the offending agent. If it's in their mouth, sweep the, sweep the mouth out. If it's in their hands, get them away from what caused the problem. Call for help. The if we were to troubleshoot bad outcomes, it's the delay in giving the intramuscular epinephrine to treat the children. It's your best friend for anaphylaxis. And the second shot could be given well within 5 to 20 minutes if the child is not significantly better. You're trying to save a life, and no one's going to ever fault you for being aggressive in that regard. Uh, when to use the epinephrine becomes a little bit problematic and sometimes very dependent upon the individualized treatment plan. With some children, you have to be fast because that's their tendency. First symptom after ingestion, they need to be taken care of. Uh, if there's ever a cardiovascular reaction in their story, then you have to be very prompt with the use of the uh, epinephrine. Second-line therapies are your antihistamines, uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine, the best and albuterol around uh, for the one that does have asthma. 
and lie the child down and get those legs raised to help support central circulation. Some of the new things that are out there uh, are uh, the concept of desensitization or tolerance and some therapies. Uh, desensitization helps someone uh, take care of a, a potential exposure. We do this a lot for drug allergy, but some of the work that we're, that's out there with uh, the desensitization, desensitization used a little bit longer, may lead to tolerance. And the tolerance is the concept that you really want to have. That means the person can tolerate small amounts of these offending foods and not get into trouble. Uh, you're going to see some work. Uh, you know, there's not a, this particular slide shows uh, that there, there are not a lot of children that are undergoing these studies uh, with peanut. In a couple sites, only 29 children are undergoing this uh, immunotherapy to the food with pretty good results. Uh, looking at the cow's milk, both at Duke and Johns Hopkins, and hazelnut. There's some studies also underway with egg, but they're all experimental. They're not out there right now for the general population. Our hopes are that they will, but you have to be very careful with some of this experimental work. Uh, the children that have undergone the milk uh, immunotherapy can, can have been able to tolerate two and a half ounces without having any reactions, and that certainly gets them over any kind of untoward exposure, happening happen to you know grab the wrong sippy cup uh, from a colleague that had milk. With peanut immunotherapy, uh, they're, they're tolerant. Go ahead. You have two minutes. Okay, they're tolerant up to about 26 peanuts, which really gets the child to any kind of uh, accidental exposure. Food allergies can be outgrown. Uh, milk, usually by age four, but we don't give up on them until they're in their teenage years. Egg, about half by age four, but a little bit more in the teenage years. We are seeing about 20% outgrowing the peanut allergies, 10%. For tree nuts, fish and shellfish tend to be lifelong endeavors. And that's all I really had to say. There's your uh, link to my uh, my website. I, I have a lot of fun with it and really focus in on a lot of food allergy issues. And your references from which a lot of this material has come from, uh, the guidelines is the second one, an excellent piece of work, all evidence-based and what Dr. Sischerer and Dr. Marr wrote for guidance about food allergy management in the school setting. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Likely. That was really a very well done explanation that I think even I gathered that. And we really appreciate your participation today. I need to tell folks that the L Foundation is new to us. It's capital E, capital L, capital L. And they brought the issue of food allergies to us. And the next two presenters will be talking about uh, their role and how that has uh, developed. And we look forward to working with them a great deal more in this uh, serious issue. The first speaker that we'll have in the, in the group will be Kathleen Silverman. Kathleen founded the L Foundation. And as the founder and president, she has managed the organization, operated a leading resource of food allergy safety training services, which are actually available across the country. Her roles include overseeing the content of the training programming, built-in collaboration with a dynamic medical advisory team, as well as pioneering ELL's Giving Back program. She'll be followed by Tammy Studebaker, who is the Director of Outreach and Education for the L Foundation. Again, that's capital E, capital L, capital L. And with this said, we look forward to hearing from Kathleen Silverman. Thank you. The L Foundation Food Allergy Safety at School Training. This is Kathleen Silverman. I am indeed the founder and president of the L Foundation. As a parent of a severely food allergic child, I launched this organization almost four years ago in response to the need that I recognized for training services that allowed these young children to integrate safely into mainstream society, whether that be at child care, camp, school, a hospital, or even within their own home environment. By highlighting potential risk areas and then building optional safety protocols to minimize these threats. So this afternoon, I'll provide a brief introduction of the L Foundation, 
I will walk through data supporting the critical need for food allergy safety training specifically at school, and I will provide a review of the responsibility of a school in addressing the needs of food allergic students. My colleague Tammy Studebaker then will step in and introduce a very brief overview of the elements of the L Foundation's Food Allergy Safety at School Training Module, um, which in its entirety contains three distinct chapters. The first chapter, Protect, provides a comprehensive review of the primary risk areas to food allergic students while at school. The second chapter, Allergic, provides an understanding of food allergies recognizing signs and symptoms, and a review of the leading hypotheses supporting the primary reasons for the growth and the severity of food allergies. The final chapter, entitled Children, is a concise review of optional protocols and procedures to incorporate into a food allergy safety policy for food allergic students. Our tool that we use, called the Risk Assessment Worksheet, is also included in this chapter. But again, for purposes of this discussion today, we will only provide a glimpse into the risk areas at school. For our full one and a half hour session, this can be viewed online and materials can be obtained directly from our organization. The L Foundation Eating, Educating, Living Life was launched in response to the need for community-based food allergy safety education and training. The organization does operate as a 501c3 not for profit that provides comprehensive training services across the country today. To support our community-based approach, food allergy education and training services have been individually designed for schools, school cafeterias, camps, child care facilities, hospitals, restaurants, and for food allergic families. L delivers these training services via an online format or through in-person trainings and workshops delivered by any one of our 250 food allergy safety trainers or registered dietitian food allergy specialists who have successfully worked through our trainer program and have achieved a trainer status. The need for food allergy safety training at school. In the school setting, the need for food allergy education and training is widespread. Roughly one out of six food allergic kids will have a reaction while at school. Approximately 25% of reported instances of epinephrine administration was for children with no known allergy previously. Accidental ingestion of an offending allergen occurs more, most often at school. Three out of four school nurses have students at risk for severe allergic reactions who do not bring an auto-injectable epinephrine to school. 56% of school nurses have witnessed an anaphylactic reaction while at school. With regard to food service personnel, limited education and training exists, as just 57% of food service personnel have been provided any sort of education or training on food allergies. A majority of school nutrition personnel are in need of educational materials, training on reading labels, recipe menu substitution information, and information on cross-contamination. Given that food allergic reactions can be triggered by eating a food, contact with a food on a contaminated surface, or through inhalation of a food protein. It's obvious that the threats of an allergic reaction may be widespread within a school setting. Where are most food allergic reactions occurring within a school environment? Surprising to many, 48% of reactions actually occur within the classroom. While just 15% of allergic reactions were triggered in the school cafeteria, 10% were triggered outside throughout the play areas. There are several common dangerous misconceptions that may put an allergic student at risk. The first dangerous misconception, 
a child that has never suffered an anaphylactic reaction never will. Signs and symptoms of prior reactions will repeat themselves. History of prior consumption of a specific food product is a good indicator that the product is safe to eat. Allergy testing provides a complete profile of future allergies and waiting for emergency medical services to arrive to administer epinephrine is safer for a child suffering an allergic reaction. Again, each of these are common dangerous misconceptions that may put a food allergic student at risk. Finally, some key questions for you as school nurses. Does your school maintain a food allergy safety policy? Are protocols in place to protect a food allergic student from inadvertent threats throughout the school? Is there an effective communication system that informs school personnel of each food allergic student and designated emergency response steps to treat his or her reaction? Are food allergic students protected from the risks of an allergic reaction due to cost contamination, prepared foods and snacks, hidden allergens in sundries and lotions, craft projects, and other activities. How is a food allergic student identified? And is there signage posted to effectively communicate protocols? Since no cure currently exists for food allergies today, avoidance is the only path to safety. What is the responsibility of a school in accommodating the needs of food allergic students? As part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, school districts are required to provide all students, regardless of a disability, with a free and appropriate public education. This is found in Section 504. It applies to any condition that might interfere with a student's ability to receive an education in a public classroom. That includes physical, mental, or emotional. As a second piece of federal legislation, the American Disabilities Act dictates that every child is entitled to the same level of education without be tr being treated differently, denied any services that others receive, or from being segregated from the rest of the students. Now, in order to understand the relevance of federal legislation, it's important to make the distinction between the disabled and non-disabled classifications as it pertains to food allergies. A student is classified as disabled if his or her food allergies may result in a severe life-threatening reaction called an anaphylactic reaction. A student is not classified as disabled if his or her food allergies are not life-threatening. Is mandated by the federal government under the National School Lunch Program and is part of the funding requirements for participating schools, substitutions to the standard meal are required for students who are considered as disabled and whose disability restricts their diet. Schools are mandated to be compliant with the regulatory criteria for a disabled person as dictated by the USDA non-discrimination regulation. Statewide policy to protect food allergic students is also evolving, as many states allow students to carry auto-injectable epinephrine while at school. Good Samaritan laws have passed in several states to shield from legal liability school personnel who administer epinephrine to anyone they believe in good faith to be having a severe allergic reaction. And state legislation is passing throughout the country to allow schools to maintain a non-specified epinephrine to be used as a backup emergency medication. In summary, the responsibility of a school in addressing the needs of food allergic students includes the following. To develop policies and protocols regarding steps to care for food allergic children that decrease the risk of exposure with inadvertent allergens and include emergency response steps to treat allergic reactions to develop necessary individual health care plans for food allergic students, to train their staff, and to communicate the school's food allergy policy, individual health care plans, 
and individual emergency action plans with the parents and caretakers. Thank you. Tammy will now proceed. Hello. I'm just putting this in the screen, sorry. My dragger is stuck. I'll be right with you. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, my name is Tammy Studebaker, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Education for the ELL Foundation. Today, I'm going to review with you some of the risks present in the school environment for food allergic children. Just a second, Tammy. Okay. Folks who are attending, please check, oh, check. Tammy, share your screen with a click on OK on the dashboard. Okay. Is that on? You got it. Got it. Okay. Okay, so you can see me? Hold on, my screen's Yeah, we're all good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, excuse me. Within our training modules, the ELL Foundation not only provides the major risk areas within an environment, but also offers ways in which to minimize these risks. There are numerous threats which occur in a food allergic environment. Some examples would include the cleaning supplies and cloths, food served, contact with other students' food with allergens, tables, counters, chairs, and the plates, utensils, and tray in the cafeteria. Schools can minimize the threats to food allergic students by focusing on three key risk areas. Number one, insufficient communication. Number two would be cross-contamination. And number three would be hidden allergens. We will now have a brief discussion into these risk areas and provide a better understanding of ways to protect food allergic students. We will start with insufficient communication. What does this mean and how can we avoid this? First, it is important to recognize the creation of effective food allergy safety procedures involves the participation of a core team of individuals. Input, feedback, and training should be inclusive of many key individuals directly involved in the safety of food allergic students. Prepare, educate, and inform. This is the backbone of effective communication as part of the implementation of a food allergy safety system. Preparing communication guidelines to include critical information such as the location of the medication, the location of the medications, the completion of an individual emergency action plan, detailing the school's emergency response steps, the mode of communication to be used, the ways in which a food allergic student will be identified, signage to communicate reminders, restrictions throughout the school, and the creation of a school food allergy safety policy to include communication guidelines. Next, we examine the need to communicate by educating and training the school staff on signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction, each student's individual emergency action plan, the school's emergency response steps, and the school's food allergy policy. It is also important to communicate and inform the food allergic student of his or her responsibilities, the individual emergency action plan, the school's protocols policy, as is age appropriate, the parents of the food allergic students should be well informed of these issues as well, informing other parents of any school or classroom restrictions is important. Our next hurdle to food allergy safety is cross-contamination. 
What does that mean, and what are the effective procedures that can be implemented to minimize the threats to a food allergic student due to cross-contamination? In general, allergen cross-contamination most typically occurs in food preparation. However, inadvertent exposure with allergens can occur in many environments. Cross-contamination occurs when a food, service, or object free of allergens inadvertently comes in contact with an allergen. This can occur through the preparation of food or the cooking, serving, eating, cleaning, or storage of food. We are not just referring to cross-contamination in the kitchen. The consumption of foods and the use of food ingredients is widespread. Allergens easily can make their way through an environment. Our last hurdle is hidden allergens. Hidden allergens can be present in many places throughout the school environment. They can be present in many places beyond the cafeteria. The ELL Foundation provides a safe craft list with all of our trainings. As you see, common allergens may be found in several craft items used within the classroom today. An example of this would be tempura, tempura paint which has eggs. Paper mache contains wheat. Checking for allergen ingredients in prepared foods, craft supplies, lotion soaps should be a common practice to determine the potential safety for food allergic children. Here are some steps to look at when reading food labels for allergens. Number one, Understand, post a reference of the different terms that indicate the presence of each food allergen. Number two, no label. Do not serve the product to an allergic child. Number three, read and reread food product labels. Manufacturers frequently change ingredients. Number four, if in question, call the manufacturer directly to verify the ingredients and whether it's produced on shared equipment. Number five, be prepared for cross-contamination from a bad batch. And the last one is no warning on the label does not equal safety. How do we keep food allergic children safe at school? We will review some effective protocols and procedures to protect the food allergic throughout the development of a food allergy policy. We have what's called a risk assessment guide. By focusing on a granular level, the ELL Foundation introduces this guide. It's a tool that lists school personnel and has an educational list of protocols to implement throughout the school. And finally, for more information for an in-person training services or to obtain training materials, here is our information. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, Kathleen. Again, excellent information for all the participants. There are about 400 people online at this moment as we move to our final uh, team member on the panel. And we will repeat the certified nurse education credits and the chess credit information after we hear from the last speaker. And we'll be opening up for questions. Sally Schussler has been serving as the interim executive director at our friends at the National Association of School Nurses for several months now. Ms. Schussler has presented nationally on a variety of school health topics, including food allergies. Before this appointment at the School Nurse Group, Ms. Schussler was Executive Director of the New York Statewide School Health Services Center. There she provided technical support and professional development to school health professionals. Ms. Schussler has experience as a school nurse, school nurse teacher. She's worked in both the elementary and secondary grade levels in public as well as private school settings. At our upcoming conference in October in Louisville, she'll be presenting two uh, concurrent workshops. One's called a Team Approach to Food Allergies Management and Education, and another called Web Quest for Teaching Elementary and Secondary Students about Food Allergies. So of course, Sally, with these presentations, was the perfect person to join this training today. At that point, I turn to my friend Sally Schussler. Thank you so much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here today.
We're going to look this, the, for the final section this afternoon at how caring for students with food allergy is a team approach. Everyone in the school has a role when it comes to caring for students with a food allergy. Uh, we, we need to all work together to make sure that we keep these children safe. And the true key to this is prevention. You've already been hearing that we need to avoid exposures, and that's something that we need to do vigilantly in our schools. A lot of schools think that it's a great idea to declare themselves allergen-free, but uh, that actually has shown that some exposures increase because uh, people conti don't continue to be quite as vigilant as they might otherwise be. So we need to work to provide that safe environment for the student. But it must always be built on respect and also with, an, uh, with a mind for a student's right to confidentiality as well, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we go. And then when an exposure does occur, which of course we're going to work very hard to make sure they don't, we need to react quickly and administer emergency care without any delay. Because the only times that there have been any fatal uh, issues at school is when the administration of epinephrine has been delayed. So we're going to start with the, what we see as the foundational person on the school team in dealing with food allergies, and that's the school nurse. Uh, the school nurse has many vital roles in setting a uh, student's uh, school experience up for success. And the first thing the school nurse needs to do is obtain a detailed health history. Uh, certainly looking, talking to the parents, looking at the medical records, making sure you've got a good picture of what this child's health history has been. The nurse also works to obtain medication orders that are signed by the medical provider as well as the parent or guardian in, in compliance with state laws and regulations, which are a little bit different in every state. Another key role of the school nurse is to develop the emergency care plan. And we will use the acronym ECP for that as we go through the program. But this is for something, a document that a nurse writes for lay, unlicensed people to use in order to uh, react to um, an emergent situation with school staff and in whether the nurse is on site or on a field trip or the uh, class is on a field trip. Certainly uh, a great plan is to have the private health care provider review the plan once it's written. And we always recommend that the parent or guardian should review and sign the plan. And that can also be a way of having the parent give that important permission to disclose medical information with staff on a need-to-know basis and as necessary in order to care for the student. The nurse also has a responsibility to alert all teachers, administration, food service staff, custodial staff, and transportation staff as allowed by the parent in order to make them all aware of the care for that that student may require. Also, it's important that the nurse is the one to train the staff as needed on that student-specific basis to administer the emergency care plan. This doesn't mean that a school nurse should stand up at a faculty meeting and say, if you have a student with a food allergy, here's what you should be doing. But it means training specific teachers about specific students so that you're making sure that you've got that student's needs met well. Also, it's important to work with the school staff to modify the student's environment as needed. Uh, it's certainly been discussed already uh, this afternoon about how important it is to think not just about food, but also of classroom instructional materials. I had a student with a peanut allergy at one time who uh, everybody did beautiful work in avoiding exposures for him. And one morning I walked into his classroom and his teacher had the, the pine cones and the peanut butter and the bird seed out. And they were going to do a project. And I was like, so glad I walked through the door because we needed to make sure that teacher understood that we weren't just talking about lunch. We were talking about every facet of that child's day and that that environment needed modification. It's also important for the school nurse to meet with the student to discuss allergy treatment and begin to develop a trusting relationship with the student. If you need to approach a student with epinephrine in the midst of an emergency, you want that child to trust you. And it's really important that the nurse develops that relationship with the student so that the student understands that the nurse only has their best interest at heart and will be there for them no matter what happens to them during a school day. As time permits, the school nurse should be considering writing an individualized health care plan, an IHP. And the IHP is uh, a nursing document written in nursing language for nursing use. So this would be something that would be on file in the student's health record that not only provides an intentional uh, plan of care for the nurse to administer, but also would inform a substitute nurse about the important issues for that student. 
We talked about 504 plans. This is something a nurse can assist with. And providing that educational overview for the entire school faculty still does have a place. Uh, presenting about generalities about food allergies at a faculty meeting can go a long way to help people understand the seriousness of food allergies. But it's so important that the school nurse continues to collaborate with parents and guardians, teachers, and healthcare providers to address the needs of the student as they continue to evolve. As we look at other people that are very important on the school team, the school nurse needs to work with the teachers, and the teachers have important responsibilities as well. They need to work to create a self safe environment for all classroom activities and all things that occur in the classroom. And again, we aren't talking about an allergen-free environment. We're talking about an allergen-safe environment or an allergen-friendly environment. And certainly, the teacher should participate in training to ensure their ability to handle not only everyday routine occurrences, but also emergency care. They need to know which allergen, allergens might cause life-threatening reaction for their students. They need to know what steps they can take to prevent exposures to those allergens. They need to be able to recognize symptoms of an allergic reaction and know how to respond if an emergency occurs. And the other thing they need to know is how to administer an epinephrine auto injector. These are, trainers are available for school nurses to use with their staff. And another great idea to do is ask parents if you can keep expired EpiPens. And, uh, and certainly you can let a teacher uh, you demonstrate the use of an auto injector into a grapefruit or an orange. And sometimes having that real life experience goes a long way for a teacher. The teacher should not only review the emergency care plan, but be prepared to administer the care needed. Certainly what you want to talk to about uh, to a teacher is making sure they would never hesitate to immediately initiate that ECP if the student reports symptoms of an allergic reaction. I worked with an allergist in Rochester, New York at one point, and he said, uh, if you say to yourself, gee, I wonder if I should give the, an epinephrine the next word in your sentence, you should by all means not finish the sentence and go ahead and give the, the epinephrine. So we do want people to know that they, they do need to react quickly. The other thing that's important for a nurse, for a teacher to understand is they should never send a student with a potential for an allergic reaction to the health office or anywhere else alone. We certainly know that these things can progress quickly, and we want to make sure that the student has someone with them to assist them at all times. The other thing that's important is to have the teacher understand the importance of communicating with substitute teachers to care for students with food allergies. They want, you want to make sure that the student's ECP is accessible in an organized format between uh, classrooms so that a teacher can find that, a substitute teacher can find that and be ready to take care. Make sure they call the nurse and they talk about any concerns that they have. Often the nurse does not know where the substitute teachers are coming in for the day. So that's an important piece of communication that the teacher needs to have as they have a substitute coming into their classroom. And, they, and the, the substitute teacher needs to know that they can, in fact, approach the school nurse with any and all questions. The teacher also can send a letter home from the classroom if the parents and guardians request that or allow that. And uh, it's always important that the student's name should not be shared in the letter. Students have a right to confidentiality, and that goes to all of their health concern issues. So what we need to do is be able to share the information but in a way that does not uh, violate their rights under FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. We need to make sure that we're providing quality care and getting the permission that we need to share that information. The teacher can also reinforce school guidelines on bullying and teasing to avoid harassing students with allergies. And this is vital. We hear stories all the time of students with food allergies, of peanut allergies, that some child thinks it's a great idea to smear peanut butter on their neck and then laugh about it and see what might happen. They, this is something where we need to impress upon other students how very important this is to protect kids that have allergies. And they, the teacher needs to be aware at all times of how that student with the allergy is being treated to be sure that there isn't anything inappropriate occurring. Food service personnel are a very key group when you're talking about managing food allergies. Food service personnel should work with the school nurse and the school administration to determine if food allergens are on the menu. They should uh, assess each thing and determine whether or not it's appropriate to remove them or to be aware of them. 
certainly they can meet with the parent and guardian to discuss specific food allergies and also provide advanced copies of the menu if requested. I worked in one school where the food service individual sat down with the mother of an incredibly allergic child and went over the whole month of the menu discussing what the child could have and what they couldn't have and then making sure that the child could have lunch at school on the days that that child wanted to because it went a long way towards that child feeling like a part of the school. The food service personnel can review the, pers the student's ECT and their health history with the help of the nurse and also can develop protocols for cleaning and sanitation, which avoids that cross-contamination that Tammy spoke about. Food service should, personnel should always allow for appropriate substitutions or modification of meals for students with allergies. And another important thing is that they should avoid the use of latex gloves in the kitchen. So many children have a latex allergy on top of a food allergy that it would be important to have non-latex gloves. It's it's a great idea to create areas of the kitchen which are allergen safe and also to have a communication system so that someone can get help for an emergency. Uh, we looked and saw that most of those emergencies are happening in the classroom, but a fair number did happen in the food service area, and they need to be sure they can get help if they need it. Your school administrator has key roles as well. Certainly, the school district should have an emergency response plan written down and ready to go, and it should also include emergency procedures for managing allergic reactions. The procedures should be developed to at the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level. There are certainly different issues for each grade level. Administration needs to support their faculty and oversee all faculty, staff, and students, as well as parents and guardians in implementing all aspects of the management plan. School administration ensures that those policies with training and education by a registered professional nurse for all involved faculty and staff include uh, an what anaphylaxis is, reactions to food, insect things, medication, or latex, look at risk reduction strategies in the school setting, and be ready to, to not only know what the emergency procedures are, but implement them as needed. And they should know how to administer epinephrine uh, often the school administrator is on site if there isn't anyone else. Also that administrator provides leadership to the school team. Other personnel that should be included in planning and care include virtually everyone in the school. School office staff, the school medical director, paraprofessionals, your mental health support staff, coaches and athletic director, and transportation personnel as well as volunteers and after school activity leaders. Think about the staff in your school to see who needs to be trained. For uh, more detailed information, uh, it's important uh, to know that the National Association of School Nurses is about to launch a web page on our page uh, called an online toolkit for managing food allergies. This will be available very soon. Uh, look for it. We'll be putting uh, information out on our listservs, on our web page, on our, and on our Facebook and Twitter. And uh, so be, be watching for that. We've created that in, uh, in conjunction with the CDC. They will have a new uh, document as well with food allergy management guidance. And the work I did in New York with a, a great multidisciplinary team is online through the uh, New York Statewide School Health Services Center called Caring for Students with Life-Threatening Allergies. And uh, while every state has some great guidance documents, uh, I, this one is near and dear to my heart and can be very helpful to you. But please do watch for the National Association of School Nurses online food allergy toolkit, which will be coming soon. Thank you, Sally. Once again, an excellent presentation. I want to thank all of our panel today for actually staying on time and staying to the schedule. It gives us 30 minutes now to open up for questions. And while Kate I. Hurwitz, who's running the dashboard here for GoToWebinar, gets that ready, I'll tell you a personal vignette, and I'm so glad, Sally, you mentioned uh, latex allergies. Back, gosh, in the dark ages of 1976, I was a young teacher of multi-handicapped preschool children. One of my kids, most are in wheelchairs, but one I didn't know had a latex allergy. So, of course, we're celebrating a birthday, and what do you have but a clown? And if you have a clown, you have to have balloons, right? So sure enough, we were able to catch, uh, before it got to this young woman, one of our aides had talked to the mother 
and knew of this allergy. So we blocked the child from serious issues. Okay, with that horror story out of the way, I'll tell you very quickly that we are going to be needing your evaluations, and we hope you'll do that to get chess credits or C&E credits. And I'll wrap up in a few minutes, but I'm tickled that we've got this much time. And I'll turn this to Kate Eichhorwitz, who will take the questions you've been submitting uh, during the time. To tell you as well, we've had a little technical trouble with echoes, so I hope we don't hit that during the next few minutes. All right, I'm going to open up everyone, all the presenters. I'm going to open up everyone, all the presenters. Yes. I apologize for the echoing problem. I'm going to have to try and open each presenter's mic as the questions come to them. So let's begin. I think I will go to Kathy first. Do you believe in a peanut-free table? If so, what about children with egg, milk, and other allergies? Kathy? That's a great question. Um, I certainly believe that there's a lot of perspectives there regarding just limiting a peanut-free table in a cafeteria and all, but I want to um, preface this by saying that the L Foundation provides information and training, but we do not take position and, and tell schools what to do. Um, we certainly acknowledge that there are optional protocols. Um, I do uh, believe that um, Sally as well made a statement that sometimes when you take everything out, um, you, lose, you lose some of your vigilance. So I, I clearly believe that um, schools have several options and clearly, you know, we, we've heard um, from Dr. Likely and all that food allergies in general are, are rising to such a great extent that it's not um, atypical to have many um, students in a, a grade with an egg allergy, for example, or a, a milk allergy. And given the severity and the number of students and all, it truly is a protocol that's up to the school to determine whether or not that constitutes having a designated uh, additional table or whatnot in a cafeteria to accommodate those students. All right, thank you. Um, next question. I think this will go to Sally. How common is it that IM, Benadryl, and oxygen are ordered in the school setting as adjunct therapy to the EpiPen? Certainly, uh, different things are allowed in different areas, and this is one thing that's really important to realize is that school nurses deal with different uh, laws and regulations, and it's really important for a nurse in every state to know their Nurse Practice Act and what's appropriate. Everything we're seeing in the, uh, in the literature is recommending that epinephrine is the first drug of choice. And I always feel that what I don't want is a teacher who's worrying about, uh, should I give the Benadryl, should I give the EpiPen? We want instructions that are clear, easy to follow, and so that so someone will actually work to save the child's life instead of standing there in confusion about what to do. Uh, very often, Benadryl can be given later, but it, it should not be. You know, it's, Sometimes it's ordered, and so that's a great moment for the school nurse to have a conversation with the physician. But it would be best if you could get a set of orders that would say epinephrine first, then Benadryl as needed. I have not heard of the oxygen as an adjunct therapy. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, 911 or EMS should be accessed as quickly as possible, and often they come with those uh, those. Um, treatments as well. And I just think it's really important for nurses to be sure that they know what can they administer in their setting. And that would that would drive a lot of that decision. Thank you. Um, I believe this is another one for Kathleen in relation to one of your slides. The question is, the definition for a student to be considered disabled necessitates predicting the severity of a food allergy reaction. Isn't that impossible as previous food reaction symptoms do not necessarily indicate the type or severity of the next food allergy reaction? Who determines if a student is disabled or not disabled when it comes to food allergies? Very good. That's a very good question. Um, and just to clarify, um, it would actually, the determination comes from the physician. So if indeed there is a propensity given, um, you know, a history of, um, anaphylaxis, um, 
or those types of reactions, severe reactions from that particular student, uh, the physician uh, would make that determination and, um, and classify the student as still having that potential for a severe reaction and classify them as a, in the disabled category. All right, the next question I um, what are the resources we can check to see if our state is covered to use stock EpiPens? Sally, do you think you could answer that for us? I sure could. Uh, the NASN at our board meeting in January uh, has backed a statement saying that the National Association of School Nurses supports the use of stock epinephrine and having an, uh, an epinephrine auto-injector, a non-patient specific order for one, available for use by a registered professional nurse who can assess students and, and determine if that is an appropriate uh, therapy to use in the event of an emergency. Uh, certainly, uh, we have state school nurse consultants in, in just about every state. Uh, so if you have a question in your state as to whether or not you ha are allowed to use a non-patient specific order, I'd suggest you contact your state school nurse consultant. If, if you don't have one, you could certainly contact your board of nursing for a ruling on that on a state-by-state -state level. All right. Thank you. Um, just to break from the questions, as a couple are coming in about the slides, I just want to let everyone know that the slides will be available um, in a day or two on the ashaweb.org website. Um, however, I will be sending out an email to all of you with evaluation data and a link to the slides once they're up. So um, just look for that. And back to the questions. Uh, we have a question here about evacuation. Um, perhaps Kathy or Tammy could answer this. How are evacuations handled? We have a practice drill coming up, and I have at least 20 students. Um, do I bring all of their EpiPens or bring the stock one we keep in the health room? I would actually defer that to Sally. Um, what is typically recommended with regard to the school nurse's role? I certainly think that is something that would be part of the emergency um, uh, action plan for the student, as well as, you know, other situations like the field trips and whatnot. But Sally, what do you typically, how is that typically handled? Well, that, thanks for allowing me to answer this question. Uh, as part of a school district emergency plan, uh, drills as well as uh, real live emergencies should be addressed. Now, one school I worked at, we I kept all my orders in a binder so that as if there was an, any evacuation, drill or otherwise, because the school nurse should be drilling for whatever might come up, we would take the emergency medications and as well as the book of orders, put it in a rolling suitcase, and out the door the nurse would go. So certainly you want to make sure that as a school nurse, you're addressing this issue for your school and for your building. Uh, if, if you are on a prolonged evacuation, one time we were outside for three hours, uh, and we were right near the woods where the bees were. So that wasn't a food allergy, but it certainly was a situation where there could be kids at risk for anaphylaxis. So you want to talk it out in advance, make some plans uh, for how are you and your district going to manage that, but it should be as a part of the building emergency plan. All right, a couple questions here about specific types of allergies. I think I will direct these to Dr. Likely. Um, I'll read two, and perhaps you can answer them both. Do you recommend that a soy that soy allergic children avoid foods that have soybean oil as an ingredient in food served at school? And then also one about uh, if a student is allergic to a kind of tree nut, for example, almond, is he also allergic to other tree nuts? Well, the oil issue, again, uh, comes up a lot, and usually the commercially available oils that are clear uh, do not contain any protein. Uh, one of the common soy confusers is soy lecithin, which is also an emulsifier. It's used to make sure things don't stick to a pan. That will not contain protein, and it's protein that elicits the allergic IgE response. So, you know, the oil issue would, would you know, usually 99.9999% of the time, you know, is not a problem with the soy protein allergic individual, okay? Now, the second has to do with the tree nuts, and I would really 
you know, when you if you look at those 2010 guidelines, uh, you have, they're all evidence based, and what they tell you is, if you're allergic to just one tree nut, that's what you should avoid that one tree nut. But uh, the practicality of the problem is, if you go to your grocery store and pick up a pack of cashews or pick up a pack of pecans or walnuts, it's going to say may contain other tree nuts because most of the big players in the tree nut industry don't don't clean their machines, and the cross contamination issue is huge in the tree nut world. So the science would say. Stay away from almond if that's all you're sensitive to. But the practical approach to daily living is if you're allergic to one tree nut, unless you can knock it out of the shell yourself for the other one, stay away from them all. All right, thank you. Um, another question. I think for Sally, our school district doesn't have a medical director, therefore we can't keep a stock EpiPen. Each student parent has to provide it? Any suggestions? Well, that is a very good question. Um, certainly uh, talk to your state school nurse consultant, see if there's another way that could happen in your, in your uh, school district area. A uh, lot of, uh, in, I have the benefit of working in New York where every school district was required to have a medical director. So that made that, that took that question out of the mix. But uh, find out uh, from um, your state school nurse consultant if there are options uh, and see if the school district could even possibly consult with a physician if that person would be willing to write the prescription for the non-patient specific order. That would be one idea. But certainly a, some brainstorming on a local level to see what would work in your area within your uh, state laws and regulations uh, might be a, a good way to approach that. All right, and I think another one for you, Sally. What about after-school programs? How do we deal with EpiPen sharing? Well, that's always difficult because what you want to avoid is the issue where the school nurse shares the EpiPen with the after-school program and then it doesn't get back. Uh, that, that's, that's a huge issue. What we, I, we've dealt with it in the past, and again, this can be made, decision can be made on a school building uh, basis. But we always ask the parents to provide a separate EpiPen to the after-school programs. And then someone who would be in the building until it closed that was a school district employee uh, would be able to access emergency medications as needed uh, so that if, if the parent hadn't provided it, then uh, that student-specific uh, medication could be accessed. But I strongly suggest the um, approach of having one pen for the after-school program and one pen for the school day. Dr. Likely, on our, from a research perspective, are there any new up-and-coming medications, desensitizations, and immunizations? I alluded to that in the slides. The, uh, the, the up-and-coming stuff is the uh, oral immunotherapy programs that are being done at uh, Arkansas, Duke, Johns Hopkins, and I think Mount Sinai as well. And that's uh, very stringent uh, protocols, very, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing a lot of reactions, so it's got to be pretty well controlled. But uh, the results are very encouraging where, again, an individual who goes through the oral immunotherapy uh, is able to tolerate exposures that uh, ordinarily would have put them into shock, where a quarter of a peanut might have put them into shock, it would take 16 peanuts to put them into shock. And it's kind of hard to imagine, imagine, you know, you know, them lining up 16 peanuts and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, having an exposure like that. So I think the encouraging things are some of these studies with oral immunotherapy. There's a lot that's out there. There's uh, something called anti-IgE. It's uh, it's, it's approved for asthma care, and uh, it's it's some people have been using it for food allergy, but it's really not a it's very expensive, not approved for that. And uh, I think you're going to see some agents like injections that are immune modulators uh, that interfere with the sequence of events, you know, in the future as well. They're 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 working on injections of proteins that the immune system thinks is peanut, but doesn't react to it as peanut and it alters the immune response. 
So you got a, you got a couple avenues that are out there, but right now there are no drops, there are no shots, there you know there is nothing other than avoidance as your mainstay therapy for food allergy. All right, for Kathy, we've gone to great lengths to exclude nuts and nut products from one grade level due to a single student with a severe allergy. How do I explain this to the parent of a diabetic student in the same classroom who has to leave class each morning to have a protein snack, often peanut butter? Um, you know, we're just really big on um, communication. And again, if indeed, you know, you go to those lengths, which is up to the school, and if that is a school-wide policy or district-wide policy to take out the nuts, um, I certainly believe in the communication, and our program has a lot of letters and things that um, schools can uh, leverage from at the beginning of a school year. Um, certainly not everybody understands, and there's pushback and all, but again, um, to keep a student healthy and to follow a school-wide policy, um, clearly I know there's another situation, given that it's a diabetic student, um, but I, I would, you just have to enforce what your policy is and stick with it. Um, I think that that's just, you know, the lack of consistency you don't want. So I know there's, you know, some situations that might be troublesome to parents and whatnot of other students, but it, it's really all about what your policy is and being consistent. Sally, where would the ideal location be for the student's EpiPen, the classroom, lunchroom, or nurse's office? Should school nurses accept more than one EpiPen per student? It's always best to have two doses of epinephrine for a student whenever possible. But that doesn't mean that they should be in separate places because very, sometimes the effectiveness of the epinephrine will wear off in 15 to 20 minutes and you need to have that second dose available. As to where to store it, that's going to have to be uh, determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Certainly, uh, as the school nurse, whenever possible, I like storing it in the school health office. Actually, there was one child who was so uh, severely allergic, I used to carry it around in my, my, my uh, scrub jacket pocket because I just never knew where I'd be when he might need it. But it's also, uh, you have to look at the school layout. Is the school nurse's office available for a quick response at all times? Is the student nurse have some treatments that might preclude her from her or him, I want to be fair, uh, from running uh, immediately to the scene of an accident, uh, an emergency? So basically, you're going to have to determine if, if the student's classroom is completely on the other side of the building or even possibly in an adjacent building, then you might want to talk about having the EpiPen right in the classroom. But if it's, if it's easily accessible from the nurse's office, I always appreciated having it there. But again, you're going to look at it case by case basis to determine what's in that student's best interest. Sally, another one. Would emergency plans be indicated for all food allergies or just those with EpiPen? Well, it's hard for a, a school nurse sometimes to know where to stop with writing care plans. Uh, we certainly could probably be writing care plans all day, every day for a whole school year. And, uh, and there are a few other things that have to happen. So I, I always say to start with your students that have epinephrine uh, ordered and have that be the children that you're writing your emergency care plans and your individualized health care plans on. And then, again, you're going to use your good nursing judgment for anyone beyond that that may have that level of need. All right, Dr. Likely, how safe is giving EpiPens for ingestion but Benadryl for skin contact or inhalation? Many parents are, and physicians are requesting this. Say, say that again. How safe is it giving EpiPens for ingestion but Benadryl for skin contact or inhalation? Very safe, very safe. I mean, the, the, the adverse effect from, from epinephrine in a, a child is, is, is very minimal if at all. I mean, there should be no hesitation. And ingestion is going to be the mode or the vector for which it accesses the systemic circulation to cause a, you know, a systemic reaction or life-threatening reaction. The, the Benadryl uh, has a role. It's, it's adjunct. It, epinephrine is your best friend. The, the Benadryl is an adjunct therapy. And if, if, if there's contact and there's contact hives, you know, the Benadryl is safe. It would work fine for that circumstance. 
All right, I've got a, a big one here. Um, I think, Kathleen, I'll send this to you. Who should make the decision whether a school should have the allergen removed? Um, you know what? I believe that the policies are made at the district level and school level. And as Sally um, discussed, and we also want to reinforce, it's a team approach. You know, your your policy is created by a team of professionals, and they determine, you know, what those protocols are. Um, I think that that's really important. Um, it's a big important message for us from the L Foundation that, um, you know, we do not train uh, and 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 train uh, whether it's schools, camps, child care facilities or whatever and, and stand up and tell them here's the stellar policy, here's what you need to do. Um, there are so many uh, well-known policies, um, school district-wide and statewide policies that are known as model policies, um, but I, and you, you know, schools can learn from those. But I do not think that um, anyone dictates what a school should do or a district should do regarding their food allergy policy. Thank you. And again, I, I want to point some. I mean, logically, I think there's a lot of rationale that comes into play. Um, you know, schools have varying numbers. While the numbers of food allergic students are growing, and clearly, um, at different the middle school versus the elementary school versus the high school, and so forth. And and also, I think it really varies based on you know the number of students, the severity of students, and truly what is the, the culture and the practice that that school um, wants to commit to. All right. Um, Sally, what's the difference between an ECP and an IHCP? An IHP is an individualized health care plan. It's a plan that's written in nursing language for a nurse to use. So this is where the nurse outlines the intentional plan of care that the nurse is going to provide to the student. It might include uh, medications, administration, uh, education, it, but it's the nursing work and care, and it's written in nursing languages, often based on nursing diagnosis with uh, your, your uh, assessment information, your plan of care, your uh, proposed nursing interventions, and, uh, but, and that, that is for the nurse to use. An emergency care plan is a, a plan directed at what em the emergency response should be, but it's written in lay language, in very clear, easy to understand language. I always wanted to think about a, a staff member standing there, scared to death because something's happening in front of them and the paper's shaking, and you want to write it in the kind of language that they're going to be able to read at that moment. And it's going to be very basic, kind of like, if you see this, you're going to do this. And it's got to be uh, easily laid out. It's going to include student uh, emergency contact information and student-specific information on, on, on medications, symptoms that have been seen in the past, as well as uh, what treatment is appropriate, you know, what medication is available and what should be happening, where, what hospital the student should be transported to, uh, all that kind of information that's going to be uh, that the nurse needs the teacher or the, a lay person to know if they're responding to an emergency. And Sally, are there any, um, where can these people go to find some templates or other information um, about the emergency care plan? Well, for the emergency care plan, uh, the National Association of School Nurses is recommending using the uh, Food Allergy Action slash Emergency Care Plan uh, developed by the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. It's, it's a great uh, emergency plan. We've had some input with them on making sure that it's, it's the gold standard, which it is. And that can be found at, on their, their website, which is www.foodallergy.org, www.foodallergy.org. Also, uh, New, when I worked in New York, uh, my colleagues and I developed an emergency care plan, and that's on that website that was on the end of the slides, which you will receive the, the um, web address for at the conclusion of the um, program. And one more for you. Um, if Benadryl is administered um, for a minor reaction, should the student be sent home or could they go back to class? That's where good nursing judgment is going to come in. I can't predict what the course of an allergic reaction would look like from uh, just from a, a scenario. You're going to have to use your nursing assessment. And this is the value. 
of having a registered professional nurse in your school is that that nurse is going to be able to assess that child and know whether it's appropriate. Certainly the nurse is going to observe that child for some length of time, but then they'll be able to make that determination. Any child who receives epinephrine should be transported to the hospital. But, uh, but certainly another, another interesting thing to make sure about is that when you talk about sending a child that's having an allergic, re potentially having an allergic reaction, sending them home, find out from when you call the parent are they going to leave that child at home and go back to work, or are they going to stay with that child? If they're going to leave that child home alone, it's better to have them in school with your nurse than home alone. So you want to make sure that you're using your nursing judgment based not only on their condition, but then also on what the parent's plan is. That's a great point there. Um, I have uh, one more question here, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Kathy or Sally, um, one of you. Under FERPA, a teacher has a legitimate educational interest in their students. This could include anything that affects safety or the life, a life-threatening illness. Why would additional consent from a parent be needed? Well, certainly uh, you are going to want to make sure that you know what your state guidance is. That is a federal law, but you're going to want to make sure that you know what, what the guidance is. And, uh, and you want to also, in New York, we certainly, an educational legitimate needs to know was defined by the school district. I always thought it was best to have the parent's permission to tell whoever I wanted to tell, and I would discuss with the parent why that was important. And to have a parent's signature on that just closed the loop and avoided any kind of misunderstandings. Sometimes care a student, caring for a student with a food allergy is a high emotion uh, situation, and you want to make sure that, that the parent trusts the nurse and the nurse trusts the parent, and the more talking we do, the better off we all are. Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was great. Okay. That summed it up. Thank you. Thank you all. Just a couple quick notes that I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Conley. Um, I just want to remind everyone, as we said before, that all copies of all of the slides will be available on our website shortly, and we'll email you with a link to those once they're ready. We'll also email you with a link to our uh, Survey Monkey evaluation that we ask that you all complete um, in a couple weeks' time, I can't promise a date, we will have the complete webinar uploaded to our website with the audio of the slides that you can rewatch it or recommend it to others. So I just wanted to remind everyone of that, and here's Dr. Conley. Just a couple of words. I want to thank all the lifeguards who listened in on this training and those who perhaps are listening later as podcasts. Thank again Kate Ig Hurwitz, uh, Sally Schussler, Tammy Studebaker, Kathleen Silverman, and Dr. Likely. Again, you know we're in Louisville. We've been plastering that all over the, the statement uh, or the screen for you. If you would look at the ASHA webpage often for updates, there is an asthma portal that leads to a large amount of resources and is updated frequently. We're seeking sponsors for future webinars, but we are looking at advanced asthma the first week of December. Visit ASHA often. We do hope to see you in Louisville, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Faculty, that was a wonderful job. Thanks again. Signing off from Bethesda, Maryland.